Hello and welcome to the Common Rounds. In today's topic, we'll be covering acute coronary syndrome, comprised of unstable angina and non-ST elevated MI or NSTEMI. And for a future topic, we'll be covering NSTEMI. So what do we mean by acute coronary syndrome? Well, there are several types of acute cardiac pathologies that can cause cardiac myocyte damage. Unstable angina is one type, and that's where patients get chest pain that is present at rest. Pain can occur with increasing frequency and with minimal exertion, and there is a reduced responsiveness to angina pectoris treatments, such as sublingual nitrates. Non-ST elevated myocardial infarction, or NSTEMI, is where myocardial infarction occurs without elevations in ST segments or bundle branch block, which you see on an ECG. So you can also expect to see a rise in cardiac enzymes suggesting cardiac myocyte damage. ST elevated myocardial infarction, on the other hand, is covered in another episode and in another topic, but you also see a rise in cardiac enzymes, but also you see ST elevation on the ECG. So in terms of pathogenesis, there are a number of causes of acute myocardial damage. A ruptured atherosclerotic plaque accounts for 75% of cases, and the remaining 25% are due to plaque erosion, exposing highly thrombogenic subendothelial matrix leading to platelet activation. And ultimately, you get thrombus formation, which causes partial or complete blockage of the artery supplying that part of the heart. If it's partial, you tend to see unstable angina and and STEMI, and if it's complete, you tend to see the STEMI variations. So as I've mentioned already, STEMI involves the entire thickness of the myocardium, and you tend to see new Q waves developing on the ECG. Non-STEMI, on the other hand, involves the subendocardium, which is the inner one-third of the myocardium. And you don't tend to see the Q waves, but you still see the elevations in the cardiac enzymes. In terms of other less common causes of pathogenesis, vasculitis, such as small or medium vessel diseases like polyarteritis nodosa, cocaine use, where coronary arteries can still be normal, can lead to coronary artery spasm or constriction leading to acute hypoxia going to the affected cardiac muscles. Procoagulant syndrome, such as antithrombin 3 deficiency or polycythemia vera, can be other causes of why you might suddenly get a blockage of artery supply in the heart. And there can be iatrogenic causes where, for example, patients go into theater for revascularization procedure and a thrombi is accidentally dislodged, which causes hypoxia further downstream. In terms of signs and symptoms, symptoms and signs can involve severe, sudden onset retrostanal chest pain or tightness, which can be frequently radiating to the left arm, neck or jaw, and is associated with nausea, sweating, and shortness of breath. It's not relieved with rest and not relieved with sublingual nitroglycerin, which is a treatment for acute angina pectoris symptoms. Silent ischemia or atypical features can also be seen in up to 20% of cases, and these patients can include diabetic patients, elderly patients, or individuals with high pain threshold who might otherwise dismiss their symptoms. From a differential diagnosis point of view, there are a number of potential causes that can mimic a myocardial infarction. Cardiac causes can include pericarditis, myocarditis, aortic dissection, and Prinz metal angina. There can be respiratory causes such as pneumonia, pulmonary emboli, and pneumothorax, and more commonly gastrointestinal symptoms such as reflux, peptic ulcer disease, esophagitis, gastritis, and pancreatitis. And finally, some musculoskeletal causes such as chondritis or recent rib injury. For example, patients been unwell, has had a cold, and has been coughing nonstop, leading to rib pain. So in terms of investigations, there are some important investigations that we need to start off with. Obviously, ordering bloods is very important. Ordering for electrolytes, looking at patients' full blood cell count because anemia can often worsen cardiac ischemia, looking at coagulation study, looking at the INR, which might be important for when we're considering thrombolysis therapy in an STEMI case, and looking at fasting lipids, although that's less urgent. There are also more cardiac-specific um, markers that we can start looking at, including cardiac enzymes and troponins. So troponins first become elevated at four hours following an MI, and they tend to peak around 44 hours after the event. They can be elevated for 10 to 14 days after an MI and can be elevated in patients with renal impairment. So we need to repeat our findings in approximately six hours to see a rising trend. Cardiac enzymes, including creatinine kinase, CKMB, which is more specific to cardiac myocytes, can also be um, looked at. These can be detected within 3 to 12 hours following NMI and peak at around 24 hours. CKMB typically returns to normal after about 48 to 72 hours, and it's good for assessing if patients are having a renal function as well. ECG is really important. It's important for differentiating between whether a patient is having a non-ST elevated versus an ST elevated MI. And other investigations that you can think about are imaging studies, such as x-rays to rule out other causes, such as pneumonia, assessing cardiac size, aortic dissection may be visible, 
to an extent, and also pericardial disease. In terms of an approach to working up a patient with an acute coronary syndrome, the best thing to do first is to do an ECG. If you see ST elevations with cardiac markers, then the patient is said to have an STMI. If you see ST depression with T-wave inversions, and increased cardiac markers, then they are said to have a non-ST elevated MI. And if there's no significant changes on the ECG, and there are no cardiac markers that are elevated, they're considered to be having an unstable angina. Patients who present with non-STEMI and unstable angina are also at an increased risk of having possible reinfarction. And the TIMI risk score can be used to stratify patients who are more likely to have an increased risk versus those who are less. The score takes into account things like patient's age, looking at coronary risk factors, looking at previous history of uh, MI, looking at aspirin use, and types of symptoms. The score can be divided into low, intermediate, and high. A low TIMI score, for example, a score between 0 to 2, is associated with a 14-day risk of reinfarction or death of approximately 8%. A high TIMI score of around 5 to 7 is associated with an event rate of approximately 31%. So it really helps inform which patients will have the greatest benefit from early aggressive therapy and invasive treatments, i.e. the high-risk group. From an initial management point of view, obviously we need to enforce the ABCD approach to ensure patients are hemodynamically stable. We can initiate some oxygen therapy to alleviate some of the hypoxia, give them some analgesia, including morphine, which can have some anxiolytic effects, and classify patients using the TIMI score to see who needs the more invasive treatments. From a pharmacological point of view, beta blockers of the initial therapy, these include things like metoprolol or atenolol, and these are given to all patients without contraindication. So in patients who have not had a decompensated heart failure, who are not in AV block, or who have severe reactive airway diseases. If patients can't tolerate beta blockers for various contraindications or other reasons, then they can be given a cardioselective calcium channel blocker, such as diltiazem. Nitrous are also very important. These are useful in patients who still have ongoing chest pain, and we can give them intravenous nitroglycerin, or otherwise we can give them oral transdermal formulations. Antiplatelet therapy is also really important. So we can give patients high-dose aspirin, so 300 milligrams. If they're undergoing invasive therapy, such as a stent placement, then we can continue high-dose aspirin therapy for one month, or otherwise decrease the dose to approximately 100 milligrams per day. Clopidogrel can also be given. It's given uh, as a loading dose with aspirin to all patients, and you often need to continue the treatment for 12 months. Having said that, if a patient's having an intensive or an invasive procedure like a stent placement, then we have to hold off the chlorpidogrel until the procedure is over. If they have had a stent, then they need to be on aspirin and chlorpidogrel for at least 12 months. There are other more exotic treatments, such as the glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors, and these can be given to patients with intermediate or high-risk TIMI scores and can be considered using them in symptomatic patients not managed well with aspirin or beta blockers plus GTN, or in patients with ECG changes, diabetes, or heart failure. But the main of treatment is aspirin and chlorpidogrel. Anticoagulant therapy is also really important because it prevents extension of the thrombus. Unfractionated heparin is the preferred choice when early invasive treatment is being considered in patients with increased risk of bleeding and those with renal impairment because it's more easily reversible. Low molecular weight heparin is also really useful because it has more predictable pharmacokinetics, unlike unfractionated heparins. Lipid lowering agents are also important, especially early treatment with high dose statin therapy because it can prevent the risk of reinfarction, but it's not something that you initiate straight away. It's something that you can wait and initiate within the hospital admission. Blood pressure management is vital and ACE inhibitors can be used because it can have renal and cardioprotective properties. Finally, invasive management can be considered, such as early angiography with revascularization. This is generally reserved for patients with intermediate or high-risk TIMI scores or high-risk features. Low TIMI score patients can be given invasive management if they have an abnormal stress testing or if cardiac output is reduced by 40% or less. This brings our presentation to an end. If you have any questions, comments, please get in touch with us through our YouTube channel, Twitter, email, and our website and Facebook page. Thank you.